Good evening and welcome to our midweek service here at Heritage Baptist Church. We appreciate so much you joining with us and as always it is our prayer that as we look into God's Word tonight that we might learn some things that will be a help to us in our own personal growth, development, relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, we want to continue our study uh, through this great gospel. John chapter 5. When, when men tell the story of their lives or they tell the story of the lives of others, it is not uncommon that many times they will skip over certain events. They may even skip over periods of time. And that's exactly what we are going to notice in our text today. Several weeks ago, you remember we saw how that the first full year of our Lord's ministry began at the Passover in April of 27 AD. It was during that time that he cleansed the temple, you remember. It was during that time that he had his meeting with that ruler of the Jews named Nicodemus. It was also during that time that the Lord Jesus performed many miracles. And then we saw him leaving Jerusalem. We saw him traveling through Samaria where he had the meeting with the woman at the well. We also saw him as he ministered to many of the Samaritans there in the city of Sychar. And then from there, we saw him traveling further northward to Cana of Galilee, where he healed the nobleman's son. Of course, we understand that during that first full year of ministry, there were many other things that the Lord Jesus did, and yet the Apostle John does not mention them. For example, he does not mention how that the Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 4 verse 16 to verse number 30 went from Cana to Nazareth. Of course, Nazareth was his hometown. All of the people there knew him as the carpenter's son, but they rejected him as their Messiah. In fact, when he claimed to be their Messiah, you go back and read the record, they tried to throw him over a cliff. John doesn't mention that. John does not mention, as we find in Luke chapter 4, verse 31 to verse 41, how the Lord Jesus then went from Nazareth to Capernaum, where he taught in their synagogue, where he cast out devils so that his fame spread abroad even further. He does not mention how that there in Capernaum, the Lord Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law and healed many others as well. John does not mention, as we find in Mark chapter 1, verse 16 to verse 20, how that the Lord Jesus during that first full year of ministry actually began calling his disciples to a life of full-time ministry. John does not mention, as we find in Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7, about the Lord's wonderful sermon on the mount that he preached. And John does not mention, as we find in Luke chapter 4, verse 42 to verse 44, how that the Lord Jesus spent a time going throughout all of Galilee preaching in the synagogues there. Rather, John skips over all of that. He skips over all of that with the words that we find in John chapter 5, verse 1, after this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up into Jerusalem. In other words, we are now going to, if we can put it in the terminology of the old VCR, uh, we're going to fast forward. We're going to fast forward to the Feast of the Jews. We're going to fast, over, uh, fast forward to the Passover, which fell on Monday, the 26th of April in the year 28 AD. And while he is once again in Jerusalem, we're going to see another amazing miracle is going to be performed. So notice with me a couple of things here. First of all, number one, the setting. The setting. The Bible says in verse number two of our text 
Now, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. A couple of things that I want us to notice here about, about this setting. First of all, the area. The area. In the days of Nehemiah, if you go back to Nehemiah chapter 3, in the days of Nehemiah, 12 gates led into the city of Jerusalem. The sheep gate was located at the northeast corner of the wall. It was just outside of that gate that you would find the sheep market that is mentioned here in our text. In that sheep market, men would be able to go and buy some sheep that had been approved for sacrifice. And they would then lead those sheep through the sheep gate to the temple itself, where that sheep would then be offered to the Lord God as a sacrifice. By the way, just as a side note, we're going to see later on in our study, it's this same gate through which the Lord Jesus would be led to be offered up as a sacrifice for the sin of the world on the cross of Calvary. So it was in this area then that we're dealing with. It's on the northeast side of the city of Jerusalem. And it was in that area then that we find a second thing, and that is the pool. And there's two things I want us to notice about it. First of all, the name of it. It was called Bethesda, which in the Hebrew language literally means house of grace or house of kindness. So there was the name of it. But also notice the construction of it. The Bible tells us that there were five porches that were built around this pool. So we see the area, we see the pool, but then I want us to notice letter C, the attraction. The attraction. Outside the little town of Blackville, South Carolina, is a piece of ground that was considered to be sacred by the Native Americans many, many years ago. And the reason was because in that area was a spring of water that was believed to have healing properties. According to a local legend, during the American Revolution, on the 22nd of December in 1781, four British soldiers were seriously wounded during the battle at Windy Hill Creek. In fact, they were wounded so severely that they were basically left for dead. The Native Americans took those four soldiers to their sacred spring, and they gave them water to drink from that spring. After drinking the water, according to the legend, all four made a complete and full recovery in fact, after drinking that water, all four of them eventually returned to active duty as if nothing had happened. As the years went by, that land, the spring, the legend was passed to different owners until 1944 when Mr. Boyston legally deeded the land to God. Even today, that piece of property is still known as God's acre. And from all over America, it is said that people will come with empty containers, both large and small, to get some of the clear, cool water with hopes that it will bring physical healing into their life. Now, I, I mention that this evening because even though we do not know how it began, we do not know what started it all. That is the same thing that we find in our text. On those five porches that surrounded that pool of Bethesda, the Bible says in verse 3 and verse 4 that there lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For, and here, here is the legend, an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And so therefore, as the Lord Jesus came to this place, 
He saw a great multitude of people with all kinds of physical ailments and all kinds of physical problems who were waiting for that magical moving of the water that would bring healing to whoever it was that was lucky enough to be the first one to get into the water. That was, that was the setting. Then notice number two, the miracle. The miracle. As the Lord Jesus came to this pool of Bethesda, I find three things here. First of all, I want us to notice his focus. The Bible says in verse 5, And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity 38 years. Now it seems, as we look at John chapter 5 and verse 14, it seems that this man's long infirmity was the result of some sin. In fact, John Phillips in his commentary noted that this man's sin, whatever it was, had overtaken him in his youth. It had robbed him of the best years of his life and had left him a paralytic right on into late middle age. Well, that certainly, that certainly agrees with the words of the wise man in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 15 when the wise man noted that the way of transgressors is hard. The way of transgressors is hard. But this also raises a question. Out of that great multitude of needy people, all of them were sinners. All of them were suffering some kind of physical difficulty. So out of that great multitude of needy people, what was it? What was it that drew the focus of the Lord Jesus to this one particular man? Now please remember, please remember the principle that we find stated in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 19 and verse number 7. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. In other words, when it comes to the God of the Bible, there is no injustice with Him. There is no favoritism shown by Him. And there is certainly no accepting of bribes with Him. Therefore, just as we saw before in John chapter 2, verse number 25, I believe that the attention of the Lord Jesus was drawn to this man because of what Jesus saw in his heart. In other words, the Lord Jesus saw this man's faith. He saw this man's faith. And even though it was, it was small like a mustard seed and it was, it was imperfect, it was a faith that had kept this man coming to this pool day after day, week after week, month after month, for 38 years this man had come. It was a faith that had been consistent, but it was also a faith that had believed that while God might send an angel to trouble the waters, it would not be the angel and it would not be the moving of the waters that would heal him. Rather, this man had a faith that was absolutely convinced that if he was healed, it would be because of the power of God's amazing grace. And it was that faith, it was that faith that captured the heart of the Lord Jesus, captured the attention of the Lord Jesus, captured the focus of the Lord Jesus, which then led letter B to his question. In John chapter 5, verse 6, the Bible says that when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Now while this man had most certainly heard of the Lord Jesus, he had heard about the many miracles that had been done in Jerusalem and, and in many other places. Uh, yet our text, John chapter 5, verse 13, makes it clear that he did not recognize him by sight. He had heard about him. 
but he had never seen him, would not recognize him by sight. And so therefore, since he did not know who was speaking to him, instead of responding to the question by asking for a healing, he simply stated his condition. Verse number seven, the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. So we see, first of all, his, his focus. We see, we see also his, his question. And then notice letter C, his command. Verse number eight and verse nine, Jesus saith unto him, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. I want you to notice three immediate things that we find in this verse. First of all, there was an immediate healing. As soon as the Lord Jesus spoke, this man could feel the strength returning to those limbs that had long been useless. Those limbs that had long been filled with weakness and were not able to do anything except to be dragged along. Now, suddenly, they are beginning to vibrate and with, a, with, a, with a renewed strength that he hasn't known for many years. Not only was there immediate healing, there was immediate obedience. As soon as he had the strength in his legs, he immediately obeyed what Jesus had said and, and he took up his bed and, and then there was an immediate display. In other words, as he begins to walk, his healing was obvious to all. And so therefore, in order to avoid a stampede that might cause hurt, in order to avoid a rush of people that might cause injury to others. The Bible says in verse 13 that Jesus conveyed himself away. In other words, he secreted himself. He somehow just disappeared from their presence. There was the setting. There was the miracle. But then I want you to notice, thirdly, the consequence. As we consider the consequence, several points that I want us to notice. First of all, there was a reprimand. The Bible says in verse number nine of our text that this great miracle was done on the Sabbath day. It's done on the Sabbath day. Now you remember in the Old Testament law, the fourth commandment, Exodus chapter 20 and verse number 10, the Lord God said that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. But through the years, through the centuries, Jewish leaders had added their own traditions concerning the various kinds of work that were forbidden. And like most religious traditions, these traditions were, to be very frank, they were ridiculous. William Barclay in his commentary, for example, has noted that it was forbidden work to carry a needle in your robe on the Sabbath. Uh, it was also forbidden work to carry your artificial teeth or to carry your wooden leg on the Sabbath. It was forbidden work to carry on your person any kind of decoration on the Sabbath. So as you can imagine, those Jews must have certainly flipped out when they see this man, he's carrying his bed and it's on the Sabbath. Notice that in verse 10 and verse 11, the Jews said unto him that was cured, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. And he answered them, he that made me whole, the same said unto me, take up thy bed and walk. In other words, even though he still did not know who the Lord was, he was convinced that the authority of one who had the power to heal him was far greater than the authority of the rules and the regulations of the religious leaders. And so they asked the question, what man is that which said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? And the Bible says, he 
that was healed wist not who it was. He's still not sure. He's still not sure. But then I want you to notice, not only do we see the reprimand, notice that there was a thanksgiving. Now, this is clearly implied, though not clearly stated. And the implication is found in verse number 14, where the Bible says that afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple. Why do you suppose this man leaves the pool of Bethesda and he goes to the temple? Well, obviously, it is so that he might give thanks to the Lord God for the healing that he had received. There was the reprimand. There was the thanksgiving. Let her see. There was a warning. The Lord Jesus in verse 14 said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. And then we find letter D. There was the testimony. In verse number 15, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Now I want you to understand, this man is not trying to get Jesus in trouble. This man is not trying to create problems for the Lord Jesus. In fact, notice it. He did not even tell the religious leaders it was the Lord Jesus who had told him to take up his bed and walk. Rather, he simply told them, it's Jesus who made me whole. In other words, it's Jesus who has not only healed my physical body and made me physically well, but it is Jesus who has spiritually cleansed me from all my sin. I am not only well physically, I am well spiritually because of Jesus. And instead of rejoicing in that fact, instead of rejoicing in the fact that here's one who has who has not only been made well physically, but his sin has been forgiven. He's been made perfectly whole spiritually and physically. Instead of rejoicing in that, these religious leaders began to create a problem. And so we find letter E, there was a persecution. The Bible says in verse 16, therefore, because of the testimony of this man, Therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things. What things? He forgave a man's sin and he healed a man of a terrible malady that had tormented him for many, many years. But he did it on the Sabbath day. And because of that, they wanted to kill him. Now, we're out of time, and we're going to take up our story from here next time. But let me close by, by making an application. Let me close by making an application, first of all, to the unsaved. If you have never put your trust in Jesus Christ, then I want you to understand this evening that your hope of salvation and your hope of eternal life will never be found in religion. Your hope of salvation, your hope of eternal life will never be found in keeping the rules and the regulations that religion would impose upon you. The truth of the matter is the only place you will ever find hope of salvation, the only place you will ever find the hope of eternal life is in the person of Jesus Christ. And in what he accomplished for you when he went to the cross of Calvary, took your sin upon himself and died in your place. And so if you've never trusted in him as your savior, then even tonight, I pray that you would do that, that, that you would call upon him, receive him, receive the forgiveness and the cleansing that, that only he can give. Let me also make an application to those who are saved. You see, just like this man in our text, the way that we walk should be a testimony to others of the wonderful truth that we have met the Savior. I hope that in your life, from day to day, 
that others might be able to see in the way you live and the way you talk and the way you and the way you act and the habits that you hold that, that they might be able to see a difference in you that you have truly met with the Savior. Our Father, we thank you this evening for your word. Take these, take these few thoughts, apply them in each heart and in each life. Lord, for the one who's never tr yet trusted Christ as their Savior, I pray tonight would be a night of salvation for them. And for those of us who know you, Lord, may the great change that has been wrought in our life through faith in Jesus Christ, may it be seen every day in the way that we live, in the way that we talk, in the way that we act. And may others clearly seen in, see in us the wonderful salvation that Jesus Christ provides. May your will be done. May your name be honored and glorified. We ask it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us this evening. Until we meet again, may God bless you.